Settlers, Chapter 10, Section 2, McCarthyism and Repression. The false view that the CPUSA and the rest of the Euro-American, quote, left, were crushed by, quote, McCarthy repression, not only serves to conceal the mass shift away from class consciousness on the part of the settler masses, but also helped U.S. imperialism to conceal the violent colonial struggles of that period. The post-war years were the golden age of the U.S. empire, when it tried to enforce its, quote, Pax Americana on a devastated world. We are really discussing three related but different phenomena. One, Cold War political repression aimed at limiting pro-Russian sympathies among liberal and radical New Deal Euro-Americans. Two, the McCarthyite purges of the U.S. government itself in an intra-imperialist policy struggle. Three, the violent terroristic counterinsurgency campaigns to crush revolutionary struggles throughout the expanded U.S. empire. End of points. It is a particular trait of Euro-American, quote, left revisionism to blur these three phenomena together while picturing itself as the main victim of U.S. imperialism. This is an outrageous lie. When we actually analyze the repression of the CPUSA, it is striking how mild it was, more like a warning from the great white father than repression. In contrast, the Euro-American, quote, left, pictures its role as one of steadfast and heroic sacrifice against the unleashed imperialist juggernaut. Len Deco, a former CPUSA activist who was publicity director of the National CIO, recalls in self-congratulation, quote, The United States was now officially launched on a bipartisan Cold War course with the, the appearance of a popular mandate. Every vote against it was a protest, a promise of resistance. Without this effort, few American progressives could have held up their heads, like those Germans who resisted the advent of Hitlerism. The Americans who opposed Cold War imperialism were overwhelmed, almost obliterated. Perhaps they were not smart to throw their weak bodies, their strong minds, their breakable spirits against the trampling onrush of reaction. But they did. End quote. This is easy to check out. Deco says that he and his CPUSA compatriots were, quote, almost obliterated, just, quote, like those Germans who resisted the advent of Hitlerism. Just to throw some light on this comparison, we should note that the casualty rate of the German communist underground against Nazism was almost 100%. Hundreds of thousands of German communists and communists from other European nations died in actual battle against the Nazis and in the Nazi death camps. In Italy alone, the communists lost 60,000 comrades in the 1943-45 armed partisan struggle against fascism. Were Deco and his CPUSA compatriots, quote, almost obliterated, like other communists who fought imperialism? In 1947, Deco was forced out of his comfortable job as publicity director of the CIO and editor of the union newspaper, CIO News. For many years thereafter, he worked as a paid journalist for the CPUSA in California. He was never beaten or tortured, never faced assassination from the death squads, never had to outwit the police, never had to spend long years of his life in prison, never knew hunger and misery, never saw his family destroyed, never was prevented from exercising his rights as a settler. Throughout, he went to public demonstrations and worked in bourgeois elections. Deco was arrested and had to face trial. He won on appeal while out on bail. 
had to give up his prestigious job and salary, and was threatened by U.S. government disapproval. Truly, we could say that the average welfare family in, quote, Bedstoy faces more repression than Decoe went through. The U.S. government repression that, quote, almost obliterated the CPUSA, in Decoe's words, was a series of warnings of mild cuffs to push Euro-Americans back into line with imperialist policy against the USSR. There were no death squads, no shootouts, no long prison sentences. The CPUSA wasn't even outlawed, and published its newspaper and held activities throughout this period. The CPUSA at the time usually called this repression a, quote, witch hunt, because it was a government campaign to promote mass political conformity by singling out, quote, communists for public abuse and scorn. It was not repression of the usual type, in which the empire tries to wipe out, to eliminate through legal and extra-legal force, an entire revolutionary movement. In 1949, some 160 CPUSAers were arrested and tried under the Smith Act for advocating, quote, the overthrow of the U.S. government through force and violence. Of these, 114 were convicted, with 29 CPUSA leaders serving federal prison sentences of two to five years. Two obscure CPUSA members, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, were executed amidst worldwide publicity in an, quote, atomic espionage hysteria. Some 400 non-citizen radicals, most of them third world members or allies of the CPUSA, were arrested for deportation under the McCarran-Walter Immigration Act of 1952. Many of these radicals later won in court. This warning harassment by Washington totally broke the back of a supposedly, quote, communist party that counted 70,000 members in its ranks in 1947. In contrast, the American Indian movement just at Pine Ridge sustained casualties between 1972 to 76 that were quantitatively greater than that of the CPUSA coast to coast during the entire 1950s. At Pine Ridge alone, AIM has lost over 90 members killed and over 200 imprisoned. The Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico in 1950-57 alone suffered many, many times the losses in dead, injured, and imprisoned than those borne by the CPUSA during the entire McCarthyite period. For that matter, both SNCC and the BPP alone also sustained far greater casualties from struggle in the 1960s than the whole CPUSA did during the 1950s. What was so great, so large, so historic about the slap that the CPUSA suffered was the loud panic it caused among the pampered Euro-American, quote, left. Quote, an empty drum makes the loudest noise. A picture. Benjamin J. Davis Jr. elected three times to represent Harlem on the New York City Council until he was sent to prison under the Smith Act. This mild repression knocked the CPUSA clear off its tracks. In a panic, their leadership concocted the delusional, quote, one minute to midnight perspective which held that world nuclear war and total fascism were about to happen. Peggy Dennis, wife of party leader Jean Dennis, recalls the shambles of their focus on survivalism. Beginning of long quote. The FBI knew, the news media knew, the remnants of the people's movements knew. Our party had taken a severe beating under the, assault, the assaults of McCarthyism, the Smith Act arrests and imprisonments, 
the continuing anti-communist hysteria. But it was reeling on the defensive. But the almost fatal blow was self-inflicted when the party leadership took the whole organization underground, placing control of daily operative financial and political decision-making into the hands of this subterranean structure. Thousands of militants in the labor movement, former anti-fascists, New Dealers, progressive party activists, former communist members, went into personal, quote, underground, dropping out of all activity, rebuilding lives in enclaves of suburban and urban obscurity. End quote. What was most telling is that for four years the CPUSA structure went underground not to wage renewed and heightened struggle, but to passively hide until full bourgeois democracy returned. Their whole movement surrendered and fell apart under the first pressure from Washington. They never even faced any real repression. When Russian Prime Minister Khrushchev made his disillusioning revelations about Stalin's rule at the 1956 20th Party Congress of the CPSU, it was just, quote, the icing on the cake. Once a white workers' vanguard and later a mass party for reform within the oppressor nation, the CPUSA had finally been reduced by U.S. imperialism to a thoroughly housebroken and frightened remnant. From 70,000 members in 1947, the CPUSA evaporated down to 7,000 in 1957. Working class radicalism had effectively ceased within the settler society, and its former main organization had politically collapsed. The capitalist newspaper headlines of that day paid little attention to that phenomenon, however. The media of the late 1940s and early 1950s was preoccupied with the larger aspects of this same imperialist campaign to whip up Euro-American society for the global confrontation with communism. The bourgeoisie then demanded only the most rigid, reactionary, and monolithic outlook from its settler followers. All had to fall in line. This McCarthyism was aimed not so much at the bottom of settler society, but at the middle, at purging the ranks of generals, educators, congressmen, diplomats, and so on. All government employees had to sign new loyalty oaths. We must remember that the infamous U.S. Senator Joseph McCarthy never harassed revolutionaries. His targets were all U.S. government employees and officials, from army officers to clerks. In a telling statement, the well-known liberal journalist George Seldes wrote at the time, quote, There is fear in Washington, not only among government employees, but among the few remaining liberals and Democrats who hoped to salvage something in the New Deal. There is fear in Hollywood. There is fear among writers, scientists, school teachers, of, among all who are not part of the reactionary movement. End quote. So that McCarthyism reflected a power struggle within the imperialist ranks between liberal and conservative forces, as well as being part of the general move of the empire to tighten up and prepare for world domination. In no sense was this 1950s repressive campaign directed at crushing some non-existent revolutionary upsurge within settler society. At the same time, on fronts of battle outside of Euro-American society, U.S. imperialism was conducting the most bloody counterinsurgency campaigns against colonial peoples. This had little to do with the CPUSA and the rest of the oppressor nation Quote left. End of section two.